Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. We are excited for you to be here with us on the Lord's Day so that we are uh, here to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Uh, as we come together in His name, it's a very important thing in the life of the believer to be here on the Lord's Day because He tells us in His Word that as the Word's preached and as the Word's sung and prayed, uh, He is here in our midst and He is uh, doing a miraculous work in us, making us more uh, to look like Christ. And so, uh, our hearts are uplifted to him as he has called us to worship uh, on this day and in his name. If you look at page 5, we do have a few announcements that we want to cover before we uh, enter into worship. We're not going to read every one, but I wanted to highlight just a few. Uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m., there will be a Christian Education Committee meeting um, with Ruling Elder Kay McGirt in the Fellowship Hall. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss Rally Day and the uh, resuming of our Wednesday night programs, and so if you are on that committee or you are interested in the work of that committee, uh, please uh, feel free to come and to participate. They would be glad to have you. Um, also, that last announcement on your uh, bulletin is that our friends at Crossway Publishers have given us free copies of uh, the book of the year last year called Gentle and Lowly, um, and so we are offering to the, them to you uh, for free. Uh, and so there are copies over there behind uh, or at the doors uh, right beside the ballot box. And so if you would like to take one or two or a handful of them uh, to share with your friends or family, please do so. Uh, that is a free gift to you from uh, Crossway Publishers. And so we are really excited to get that resource in your hands. It was uh, easily the best book I read uh, last year. And so uh, I'm, I'm especially and personally excited for you to, to read it if you haven't already. Uh, also, we're in the middle of officer nominations, and so if you have not nominated any man for uh, the office of elder and deacon, we ask that you would consider to do so. Uh, the ballots are on the ballot boxes here in the sanctuary or uh, there in the hallway of the educational wing. Uh, and so we need three elders to be nominated and three men, or four men, sorry, for the office of deacon. And so please prayerfully participate. Uh, in this vital part of our church membership. We do have a uh, congregational meeting this upcoming Wednesday night at 6.30 uh, that's taking place uh, during our prayer meeting time, uh, and then we will have a special season of prayer following that, uh, that congregational meeting as well. And so please make plans to be with us this upcoming Wednesday uh, at 6.30. That concludes our time of announcements. Let us uh, prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God. If you will stand as you are able and turn to page 2 in your bulletin, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. I'll read the regular print and we'll read together the bold. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our pleas for mercy. The Lord is our strength and shield. In him does our hearts trust. We rejoice and we give thanks to him. The Lord is the salvation of his people. Bless his holy name. As we come into the courts of heaven, we turn in our hymn books first to 172. Uh, let us love and sing and wonder. Let's sing together.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are worthy of our praise and our adoration, for you have washed us in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's only through him that we are enabled to worship you rightly. It's only through him that we have access to the throne room of mercy, to heaven itself, so that we might join the chorus of the saints that have gone before and the angels above. And so, Father, we pray that you would be pleased with our worship this morning, that as we uh, sit under the ordinary means of grace, that you would transform us by your Spirit so that we may look more like Christ. Would you revive us, O Lord? Would you render the heavens to us so that we may live unto righteousness? Would you even teach us to pray as Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's always such a privilege here within the life of our church to Uh, get to uh, baptize one of our covenant children we have uh, before us this morning, uh, Laurel Catherine uh, Arnett, the daughter of Corvin and Catherine Arnett. And so if you aren't familiar with why we baptize children, or if you just need a refresher course on why we baptize our children, we believe that there's a a great continuity uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where God told his people All the way back in Genesis chapter 17, for them to give the sign of the covenant to their children. And this sign of the covenant was a promise that they will be my children and I will be their God forever and ever. And as we transition there into the New Testament in Acts chapter 2, we see Peter reclaiming that promise for the children of believers. That this promise of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father is for you and your children and those who are far off. And so we come recognizing that this water, while it does not save this child, it brings her into the covenant community here at First Presbyterian Church, signing and sealing uh, the stamp of God's covenant promises upon her life. Here's the covenant promises as read throughout the scriptures. For you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thou house. Uh, And that is the promise we come to uh, celebrate uh, this morning as we uh, bring uh, little Laurel to... Uh, the baptismal font. And so, Corbin and Catherine, if y'all come with Laurel and Dr. Brown uh, as granddaddy and as ruling elder, uh, he has a very special job today. Um, And so we asked uh, Corbin and Catherine these vows before the session. I'm going to ask them before you. Corbin and Catherine, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her, and you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointments to bring her up and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, do you? Of course, this is a covenant family practice that we're doing. And so, congregation of First Presbyterian Church, there is a vow for you as well. And so, do you as the congregation of First Presbyterian Church undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in teaching Laurel the Christian way of life and bring her up, bring her up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? If you will, please say, I do. Let's see how this is going to work. Come here. Hey. How are you? What's the name of your child? Laurel Catherine Arnett. Arnett. I baptize you in the name of the Father. 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we recognize that for little Laurel, you have blessed her as the child of your covenant. For her, you have made the world. For her, you have sent the prophets and the patriarchs before us. For you, you have made covenant promises to us. And for her, you have let your word be written down for her to read. For her, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ became man, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross, but was raised up in power for our salvation. We know that Laurel can't know these things now, but we, as a covenant community, promise to tell them to her until she makes this faith her own. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. First Presbyterian Church, see how much the Lord loves us, that he gives us covenant children like Laurel Catherine Arnett, our newest covenant family member. She likes my microphone. You did very good, Laurel. There you go. You want to go to Daddy? <laughs> Let us uh, now stand and sing our baptismal hymn together. If you'll take those hymn books out and turn to page 189, let's sing that well familiar children's hymn, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, verses 1 and 2. Amen. You may be seated. It's time for us to take up our tithes and our offerings, but we ask that you would use this time for personal worship as we give back the first fruits of God's blessings unto his name.
Father in heaven, you are the maker and sustainer of all things in this life, and you are our good Father who gives us good gifts from above. And as an act of obedience, according to your word, we give back the first fruits of those blessings unto you, and we pray that you would use them to glorify your name and advance your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. If you will remain standing and take those hymn books out again and turn to page 701, we're going to sing that hymn, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Let me remind you that it's during this hymn that if you would like your child to be excused to Children's Church, they can be excused there at the back of the sanctuary. Let's sing together. be seated again. As you are sitting, let us uh, turn our attention back to our God in prayer. Father in heaven, we do know that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and it's only through your infinite mercy and your steadfast love that you have uh, called us uh, sons and daughters of the Most High. And so, Father, as we come uh, knowing that it is only by your grace and only by your steadfast love that we are made worthy, we come asking uh, that you would continue to pour out good blessings upon us, your people. Uh, Father, you tell us in your word that you are the good Father and you give us good gifts and that we have not because we ask not. And so, Father, we come asking uh, that you would indeed be the comforter to the comfortless, that you would be the power to the powerless, that you would sanctify us and take away the struggles with our sins, that you would Father, heal our illnesses and that you would indeed heal our pains. Father, we come asking that you would indeed revive us, that you would send revival to our land, that you would raise up gospel-proclaiming churches, and that you would uh, indeed, O Lord, uh, pack the sanctuaries of those churches so that men, women, and children might be encouraged and saved. Father, we pray for even that good work to be done, even this time as we gather around your word to hear you speak to us. Let us be reminded, O oh Lord, that, that as we come and as we listen to your word read and preached, you are speaking loudly to your servants. And so, 
let us tend our ears to listen. And let us not only listen, but let us also do. And let us live out a life of gospel obedience so that we might not face the judgment of God. Father, we pray that we would be transformed through the reading and preaching of your word. We pray that we would be encouraged where we need encouragement. That we would be convicted where we need conviction. That we would be strengthened where we need strength. All by your mercy and by your grace. And so, Father, give us those ears to hear. Pour out your spirit upon us afresh so that we might surely say that we have heard our master speak and it has spurred us on to do more good works for his name. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. If you will take out your Bibles and turn with me to the 50th Psalm. Psalm 50. Last week, during our journey through the wisdom songs that's found here within our Psalter, we were looking at Psalm 49. Well, this morning we are looking at Psalm 50. And just so that we would be aware of what is taking place here, I'll tell you that there's a little bit of a surprise that takes place in the midst of this psalm. As the author writes this psalm under the inspiration and authority of the Holy Spirit, he leaves you with almost a cliffhanger between the people of God and the nations of the world. And we'll see that surprise as we read it together. And then we'll draw from that surprise for our sermon. And so again, let us read Psalm 50. We're going to read the entirety of it, all 23 verses. And so people of God hear the word of God. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. <clears throat> and so, like I said, this psalm contains somewhat of a surprise. Now, the picture that you need to have before you as we even journey into this psalm is, is almost a courtroom setting where God himself is sitting as the judge. And so he begins summoning the world. He says for all nations under heaven and earth to come to this place called Zion, to come to this place where God dwells, all the nations, all the peoples come to this place so that we might see, verse 2, out of Zion the perfection of beauty, that God shines forth from there. 
And so this judgment room, this courtroom, is one of beauty and of grace. It's one of salvation uh, and love and adoration. And all of the nations are called to come before this God that is beautiful in every way. And yet the surprise is that as we enter into this courtroom, with God himself sitting as judge, it's not the nations who are being searched. It's not the nations who are being confronted by their sin, but actually God's people are being called out for their sin. And the nations are brought in for, really, to be the witnesses of their sins. You see, this is a total shock to the readers of this psalm. Because it's here that uh, in the historical context we have a people of God who are afflicted in every way. And so as the nations are being summoned, summoned, they surely are saying, this is the time that we will be vindicated. This is the time where all of our enemies will be persecuted and judged by the Lord. They even cry out, God, reveal yourself. Show yourself as, as just and show yourself in your wrath against our enemies. And yet, the, the, the turn of this psalm is that they are calling down that judgment, that searching judgment, that righteous anger upon themselves. It's a surprise to us. It's a surprise for the, the historical reader, and it's a surprise to us. So often in the Psalter, so often in our journey through these psalms, we see the very opposite taking place, a declaration that the righteous will be upheld and the enemies of God's people will be judged and destroyed and yet the warning the warning here is for God's people and yet at the same time there's a promise of salvation for his people for God's people if they would simply repent and so as we enter into the courtroom that this psalm pushes us into we see the nations standing as witnesses, God himself sitting as judge, and God's people being searched and being judged for their sins. And there's going to be two sins in particular that God calls them out for. But let's focus on verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6 for our first main point. We're going to have four of them this morning, but our first main point is simply that God summons the world to the courtroom. Notice as, as God's people come into this courtroom of sorts, as they wrongly believe that it's going to be the nations who are being judged by God, that they don't want the beauty of Zion. You see, Zion is that Old Testament name for Jerusalem. That is the place where God dwells there in His temple. And so as they enter into the temple, so to speak, as the nations enter into the temple, we know that the temple was more beautiful than any building that ever existed. It was full of the rarest of jewels and the finest of golds. And, and it's big and it's beautiful beyond all comparison. And so it's a revelation that God Himself is one who enjoys goodness and enjoys grace and enjoys your beholding His beauty. And notice that as God's people say, it's going to be the nation's judge, they don't want this scene of grace and beauty and steadfast love. If you actually look in verse 3, they, they kind of call God to come and to not keep silent, but they, they change the scene, it seems. It's not perfect beauty that's shining forth from God, but now it's a devouring fire. Around him is a mighty tempest. And immediately, Old Testament readers, their minds would go from Mount Zion where the temple is, where all the beauty of God is, to the Mount Sinai where there's fear and trembling and thunder and lightning and tempestuous winds that are howling around them. It is a, it is a visual reminder of a wrathful God who demands who demands righteousness, who demands holiness, who demands obedience. And so they come into this courtroom and they don't want the nations judged with grace. They want the nations judged with anger. They want the nations to be judged in wrath, but they have no clue what is coming in verse 4. 
Because their, their calls to God, their prayers for God to be filled with a devouring fire is going to be carried out, but it's going to be carried out against them. And so you look at verse 4. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that He may judge who? His people. Now, we probably, if we were to admit, we were probably like God's people expecting Him to judge the nations. We were expecting, verse 4, to say that He may judge the world, not His people. For surely it's the nations who have not followed after Him. It's the nations who have rejected His rule. It's the nations who have gone their own way. It's the nations who have persecuted His people. It's, it's so often like us, the, the people of God in our text are going, you know, those people who are bad out there, you judge them and you be as hateful as you need to be. You be as jealous as you need to be. You be as angry as you need to be. But with me, we need grace. But with me, we need mercy. And, and so God flips the, the, the script a little bit here as he says, let the nations observe me being just, not to them, but to my people, for they have sinned. His people are going to be the ones who face His searching judgment. And, and it's here in Psalm 50 that, that in the most profound way we are seeing an Old Testament theme being played out before our eyes. This theme is simply that judgment begins in the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. It's so vital for us to understand that, that this is that this is what happens within, within God's people. We are so tempted to point our fingers at the wickedness of the world around us, but we need, to re we need to remember that when God moves to judge, and He does move to judge, He begins with His own people. You think about the Old Testament examples, and we could spend our entire time this morning just walking through many of these examples, but you think about even the the empire of Babylon, who take over and destroy the nation of Israel and take for themselves God's people as their slaves. And God's people are living in exile for hundreds of years. Do you remember what the proclamation was before Babylon came? That God is a God of justice and judgment. That God is one who will destroy His enemies but it must first begin with God destroying His enemies even within His uh, covenant community. That His judgment must search out the sins even within the house of God so that it might be purified. When Jeremiah, the prophet, is called to bear the Word of God there against Israel, he begins to preach a message of judgment and who faces that judgment beyond anybody else? Well, it's Jeremiah the prophet. The very mouthpiece of God. Of course, he would have preferred to have preached a message of you know, health and wealth. Of course, he would want to preach a message of comfort in a very dark time for the people of God. But he was to preach judgment. And because he was called to preach judgment, he faced the judgment himself. You see, judgment always begins in the house of God. You know, if we can be frank with one another, there's no doctrine that the world hates more, especially when it's proclaimed from the church that God is a God of judgment against sin. And, and always, it seems so hypocritical in the minds of the unbeliever because you're saying, oh, you want God to judge us as sinners in the outside world, but there you are, not being judged. Well, Psalm 50 puts that, puts that away, doesn't it? That, that God always starts here in the house of God. He searches out the sins amongst His own people, and He purifies His bride way before He moves out into the world. 
And so you might say that as the nations are gathering as the witnesses of God's judgment, it's almost as a foreshadowing of the judgment that is going to come to them. If I will be just, if I will be wrathful, if I will search out the sins of even my own children, how much nations do you think that I will come after your sins and I will punish your iniquities? And that is the message that's before us. That God always starts His judgment, His searching his purifying there within the house of God, the church, so that it might be a warning to those on the outside that their sins will be found out as well. But what are these two indictments that, that God brings to His people? What are these two sins that, that God is challenging His people to repent of? And the first one is a misunderstanding of worship. A misunderstanding of worship is found for us really in that second section of text, verses 7 through 15. And actually, if we can take it a step farther, it's not just a misunderstanding of what worship is, but it's a misunderstanding of who God is. And I think those go hand in hand with one another. Because if we look at verses 7 through 15, we'll notice something very quickly about these accusations that God is bringing to His people. He says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. And then he moves directly into kind of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. He says there's something missing within your religious life, within your piety. There's something lacking in your walk with me. And he gets very specific and he says, you're not worshiping rightly. Now, if we can summarize what the problem is in their worship, it's a problem of formalism. It's a problem of formalism. They, they, go, through all the, they go through all the pomp and circumstance of worship. They stand when they're supposed to stand. They sing when they're supposed to sing. They sacrifice when they're supposed to sacrifice. They bow their heads in prayer when they're supposed to bow their heads in prayer. They're doing all the the exterior things that, that look right and look pleasing, but they misunderstand why they are doing all of these things. They're just kind of going through the motions of the worship of God. And he says, it's almost, it's almost humorous the way he, he says it. He says, listen, you're obeying the commandments. You're, you're performing the sacrifices. You're showing up to church when you're supposed to show up to church but you think that you're doing it for me. You think that you're giving these sacrifices for me. And yet, I don't need your bulls. And I don't need your goats. And I don't need your birds. Look at verse, look at verse I guess, 9. Starting in verse 9. I will not accept the bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. You're not doing these acts of worship for my benefit. You're doing them for your benefit. I don't need it. I don't need you to glorify my name, but you need to glorify my name. Even the rocks will cry out and worship, the Bible says, if the people of God will not. And so God's saying, listen, I have my creation who will worship me. It all belongs to me. And yet you need to worship. You need to sacrifice. You need to pray. You need to sing. You need to hear my word preached. You need these things for your benefit. And of course, what is the benefit of our worship? Well, it's the same benefit of the sacrificial system. That it reminds us that we need a Savior. That we need a Savior whose name is Jesus, who is that spotless and perfect Lamb of God, who shed His blood for the ransom of many, so that we would not have to live in our own righteousness, but we could be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is what we need. We need to be reminded Sunday after Sunday, both morning and evening, every Lord's Day, that we need to be reminded that it is only through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, that we are washed as white as snow. 
But we also need to know how we are to worship. We need to know why we give these offerings of thanksgiving unto God. And it's exactly the same reason that we need to be reminded that we need forgiveness. Because God has done so much for us in the person and work of Christ Jesus. It is our automatic response to worship Him in spirit and in truth just as He desires for us to be. It is good for you to be here to hear the Word read, to hear the Word preached, to hear the Word sung, to hear the Word prayed, but we need to know why we are doing the things that we are doing, and it's only so that we may worship God rightly as He has been good to us in Christ Jesus. Everything in the Christian life flows from who God is, and God is the one who sits in Zion, just as, just as our psalm tells us, and He is beauty and grace, and He is steadfast love and compassion and mercy. And He says, because I have been merciful to you in Christ Jesus, you need to worship Me in spirit and in truth. And so that's the first indictment. They misunderstand worship. But the second indictment is that they are they are hypocritical. If you look at verses really 16 through 21, God says, within the, within the people of God who are standing on trial, you have these people who are, who are worshiping. Uh, you know, they mean well, <laughs> if you could say that. They, they have some integrity and some sincerity about their worship, but they're just doing it wrong. That's one group, and then the next group is just hypocrites and he actually calls them wicked but to the wicked God says and don't misunderstand God's not then turning to the nations there's some commentators who gets that wrong they think that God's only talking to his people up until verse 15 and then in verse 16 he's moving to the nations no that's not what's happening he's looking at the second group of his people and he says those hypocrites you are wicked what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips, for you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. And then he moves on and he begins to give these summary statements of the Ten Commandments and the rest of that section. But what he wants you to see, what God is challenging his people to be, is to be people who not only hear the word, but that do the word. He wants a people who don't just give him lip service, don't just say the right things, but, but actually live out the gospel. And so if we understand the hypocrite here within our text that's being described, this hypocrite would accept the biblical diagnosis of the human condition. They would say that they're sinners, that they're dead in their trespasses. They would say that they understand how Jesus' life, death, and resurrection will cure them of their sinfulness that corrupts their heart. They even go to church on occasion. They know the central teachings of the faith. And yet, there's nothing distinctively Christian about their life. The hypocrite might be a good neighbor. They might belong to a civic club or two within the community. But there is no gospel obedience to be found. That is the second group of people that the Lord confronts there in verse 16. Those who that he calls wicked. They're hypocrites. And so we have the benefit of the New Testament. We have the benefit of the book of like James that tells us that we must not be just hearers of the word, but we must be doers also. That the only true and acceptable religion before God acts out of obedience. You see, here in the courtroom of the Almighty, God Himself reigning as judge here in Psalm 150, it tells us, that there's no reason for us to fall into some sort of false security if our faith isn't followed up with actions. Our faith must live out our life and our actions and our doing to prove, James says, that it's real faith. So James goes through it very clearly. He says, if you have faith, you will act out of obedience. If you have Faith, you will love God and love neighbor. If you have faith, 
you will work out your salvation. And you cannot separate the two. One commentator says that there is a relationship between faith and works. They're connected together completely and wholly. And it's immature, shallow, and to be blunt, damning if you try to separate the two. Because here it is in Psalm 50 that the accusation, the accusation against God's people, these hypocrites, these wicked people, is that they say that they love God, but they don't obey God. But believer, to know God is to love God, and to love God is to obey God. It's all the, it's all the same thing. And so God says to, to some of His people here in the courtroom that they are hypocrites. They might confess Him with their mouth, but they do not live out a life of obedience. And in verses 22 and 23, as we close our time in Psalm 50, you'll see God's words calling these hypocrites and these, these worshipers who are misunderstanding what they're doing, He's calling them to repentance. But first you have to see the, the anger and the wrath that comes from God because He gives us very hard words in verse 22. Mark this then, you who forget God. I think that is a, a fascinating way to put it. He's talking to those hypocrites again, and he says, you might say that you know me. You might say that you belong to me. You might say that you even believe in me, but your life, the way that you live your life has shown me that you have forgotten who I am and forgotten how I've commanded you to live and he says, for you hypocrites, I will tear you apart and there will be none to deliver. Those are hard words. That if we just confess Jesus with our mouth and yet our faith never proves itself in actions, in love, and in works, we will meet God on the final judgment one day when He doesn't offer repentance and salvation and we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but we will enter into the place of gnashing and teeth and destruction and judgment forever and ever because we surely and truly don't belong to Him. And so He gives us those sobering words to us that if we live a life that just simply professes Christ with our lips and, and yet we forget Him with our life, we will meet His judgment forever. But then in verse 23, He moves to those others, those worshipers who are just worshiping unrightly and he says, don't offer me a sacrifice just to offer me a sacrifice. No, offer me a sacrifice of thanksgiving that honors me. And if you will just simply honor me, I will be the one who will show you my salvation. Isn't that, a, isn't that an awesome way to end this psalm? It's so sobering. It's such a warning to us. It's almost as if He's sitting us down in the divine courtroom calling us to repentance and further faith. And He says, if you will do that, I will show you my salvation. I will show you my compassion. I will show you my mercy. I know you have called for the fiery anger of God, but if you will simply recognize your sin and repent of that sin, I will show you the beauty that you really desire. I will show you the, the way I am gentle and lowly in heart towards sinners. I will show you the compassion that you need so that you might be spurred on with mercy. You know, as we hear this call for mercy, you might think, I am the one who just goes through the flows of Sunday worship. I sing my heart out. I listen to your sermons. I bow my head in prayer, but I don't know why in the world I'm doing these things. God calls you to put away that formalism and to worship Him with your whole heart and spirit and in truth. And He says that if you will do that, He will show you His salvation. And you might be here and you might say, I'm that hypocrite, Matt, that says that I belong to the, the sheepfold of the Good Shepherd Christ Jesus. I'm the one that says with my mouth that I believe in Him as Lord, but He has no control over my life. If you will simply surrender all to Him, He will say, I will show you my salvation that belongs in Christ Jesus. You see how we respond to this beautiful 
call to repentance here in verse 23 is that we listen and we repent. We listen and we repent because, because sinners like me and like you, we need God's grace and mercy each and every day. And we need Him to show us Christ to be more beautiful from the mountain of Zion so that we might worship Him well and rightly and so that we might give our lives wholly to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May the Lord do that this morning in us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come as a thankful people that your grace has been extended to us as you call us to search ourselves for those sins of hypocrisy and formalism. And you tell us, O oh Lord, that if you would simply... Uh, that if we would simply come to you in faith and repentance, you would save to the uttermost. And so, Father, we pray that we would do that. We pray that we would recognize our sin and that we would turn from it and turn towards Christ Jesus. That we would be those people uh, who fall more in love with Christ this very day. And as we fall more in love with him, as we know him more, that we would obey him more. For Christ's sake, amen. It's good for us to sing in response to God's word. And so, if you will... Please stand as you're able, and let's turn to hymn number 521, and let's sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. People of God, receive the blessings of God. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.